Alrighty, hello guys. Um, welcome back to the Poor Motion YouTube channel. Uh, I'm David, and I'll be running through a quick video on a beginner's guide to RPE and how to use it. So, uh, let's dive straight in. Let's not waste any time. RPE stands for Rate of Perceived Exertion. More simply, uh, RPE is just asking yourself how difficult was the set you just performed, or how many more reps did I have in reserve, uh, commonly referred to as RIR. This rating of how difficult a set was, or how many reps you had left, can be reflected or detailed using a 1 to 10 scale. 1 being almost no effort at all, or having 9 or so reps in the tank, and 10 being absolutely maximal effort, so I couldn't do any more reps, and I couldn't add any more weight to the bar with the rep that I'm doing. Depending on the coach or how you personally get the most out of RPE, uh, this will dictate whether you offer a more feel-based approach on RPE or a more reps and reserve-based approach. Neither of these are wrong. Uh, they are just different and they have different um, benefits, pros and cons, uh, depending on when you use them. An easy example to explain this would be, let's say we have an athlete who moves a weight with what looks like relative ease, so it looks pretty easy. Um, they then rack the bar and then report that it felt very, very hard and heavy this athlete may be better off making the RPE judgments based off of bar speed and reps in reserve. So looking back at the footage and uh, sort of analyzing what's going on there. Um, this might be the better approach as opposed to uh, rating the set of how it actually felt. So this is where RPE can become a little bit tricky, but also very individualized and custom to a particular athlete. Oftentimes, a mix of both bar speed or reps in reserve and perceived effort and how the set actually felt is the best course of action and works very well for managing fatigue, which is the end goal of what we're using RPE for. Below are two attached graphics uh, that do an excellent job of illustrating the differences between the two sort of more feel-based approach and more reps in reserve-based approach. So if we take a look at the blue table here, this is from the guys at 3DMJ, so shout out to them for putting this together. Um, so we've gotten a scale at 1 to 4, so uh, hardly any, any effort at all. That's what we're talking about with that RP1. Um, yeah, zero effort, no exertion there. Uh, 5 to 6, this is generally where the scale starts. So we usually start at RP5 as our first rating. Um, so this is slight effort, but load is still moving quite fast. We then move up to that sort of 6, 6.5, 7. Uh, these reps don't slow down when you're actually completing them, um, but they definitely feel harder, that's for sure. That's seven, seven and a half range. The rep did not slow compared to prior reps, but you needed to push really, really hard, give maximal effort to keep the speed of the bar there. RP8, what do these feel like? So with maximum effort, this rep feels slower, uh, but does not look it. So it's still moving reasonably quick, um, but you're trying all out, 110%, going as hard as you can, just to try and keep some sort of speed there. Uh, eight and a half, nine-ish, we've got a maximum effort. The rep is noticeably slower, slight grinder. Um, definitely getting really, really hard here. That nine and a half, as much effort as you can muster, trying all out. This rep is a grinder. Um, if you had a little bit more weight on the bar, you still would have got it. This moves us to a 10, so it's a grinder. This is an absolute max. You couldn't add a single gram to the bar without failing it. So... Uh, a grinder you barely got, basically positive failure. So a grinder could be taking like a five second grind here, sort of panache style, um, but it's absolutely maximal, nothing left to go. RP, you know, 10.5, 11, whatever, that's a failed rep. Um, you didn't get the rep out, maybe you squatted one inch and then re-racked it or whatever. Like this is just a no rep, basically. The weight was too heavy. Uh, let's move to the RP scale based on reps and reserve. So again, one to four, very light. Uh, to sort of minimal effort. Uh, back to where the five starts here, we've got around four to six more reps if we're in that RP five to six range. RP seven could do three more reps. RP seven and a half could definitely do two, maybe three. Eight, definitely two more, and etc. etc. This is basically just a scale of whatever you rate the RP, minus that away from 10, whatever you're left with, that's sort of your reps in reserve. Pretty easy to understand there. So, why do we actually use RPE? What's so good about it? Um, what's the hype? Uh, in my opinion, the most attractive thing about RPE and why it's so widely used is its built-in auto regulation. So what does that mean? This means it considers how you feel on any given day and what your preparedness level might be for the session you're about to hit, and it matches your training uh, with that. So if you're particularly stressed, underslept, um, 
nutrition has been awful, or you have any external factors that are affecting you negatively, um, RP is an excellent tool to use to match our readiness to train with the weights we're about to lift. <clears throat> Excuse me. So on days we feel less than average, our weights might move down a little bit. Uh, we might take a foot off the gas pedal. And on days we feel super strong, that's where we might push the envelope a little bit, up our weights, you know, start looking for some progress and those sorts of things. This style of training manages fatigue brilliantly, and it stops athletes from digging their metaphorical fatigue hole even deeper by continuing to add load to the bar on the days they already feel tired and fatigued on. And that's the key, I think, here. So <clears throat> other things that it's really good at is lifter autonomy. So it gives the lifter the choice of what they want to put on the bar. So if they feel really tired, really stressed, if they are just having a really bad day, we're not pushing them even further down that and we let the lifter choose the load. This can have detriments and drawbacks, which I'll talk about later, uh, but overall, I do think lifter autonomy is hugely important. And then again, individual programming, if you know someone gets a lot out of very, very sub-maximal work, we can then choose to program that by choosing that more 6, 7 RPE range and vice versa. If someone thrives off intensity, we can match that by giving them lots of aids, those sorts of things. <clears throat> so, implementing RPE into your own training, how do we do it? Uh, there are tons of different ways, um, and I think it depends on where you're at in your training journey. So, if you're novice, intermediate, advanced, all those sorts of things. Um, so, I'm going to run through a couple of ways we can start that, starting with beginners um, and something that I like to use for my guys. So, uh, heaps of ways to start, but everyone has a different approach or method, so don't take this as gospel. This is just what I like to do with uh, very, very new lifters. So the first thing to note about learning how to use RPE is you need to know what an RPE 10 actually feels like. So if you don't know what a 10 feels like, you don't know what a 9 is, you don't know what an 8 is, you don't know what a 7 is, etc., etc. You've got nothing to draw on. You've got no past experience um, to sort of give you, uh, I guess, like a, a starting point of, you know, I remember doing this set. It felt super hard. I guess this was a little bit easier than that. So therefore, this is a 8 or whatever. So... We need to know what true exertion, true maximal exertion feels like. A tool I've commonly used with very new lifters is using machine AMRAPs. So uh, basically what I'll do is I'll assign a set load to their main compound movements and attach an RP rating to an accessory movement. So they do their don't know, back squats or whatever. And then after that, we move to the hack squat. On this hack squat set, we're going to take an AMRAP and we're going to make the RP8. So all we're going to do is before the set begins, I'll ask the athlete, um, just sort of just do as many reps as they think they can up to what is an RP8 or where they have two reps left in reserve. Uh, once they get there, they'll stop. They'll let me know, okay, I feel like when I got to eight reps on this hack squat at 30 kilos, that was an RP8. From there, we're going to go as many reps as we can. We're going all the way to failure just to see where they end up. Most of the time, they will stop far earlier than what an RP8 or two reps in reserve is. Uh, so we get that going. We ask them to perform the AMRAP and see if they're accurate. This kind of tool can be very useful in teaching a new lifter what two rips in reserve actually feels like and gives them a lived experience to draw on of what an RPA it actually is. Um, so again, this will just be for newer lifters. Uh, let them have a go at an AMRAP, see what they can actually push, what their body is capable of, um, and let them see you know, what their eight actually is. Uh, the same approach can be done with uh, more experienced trainees who misjudge their RPE as well. So using this approach on machines gives you a safe environment to practice high effort sets uh, without technical breakdown, and it helps the lifter to learn what hard training actually feels like and what these RPE 7, 8, or 9 sets are. So once they've spent some time learning with AMRAP sets on these machines, you can start the transition to their barbell training. Uh, this can also be done at the same time. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Uh, but in my experience, the best way to start learning RPE um, for beginners is these machine AMRAPs. Um, quick side note or PSA, I wouldn't run these machine AMRAPs for very long. I'd say three to six weeks max. As you can imagine, this can be very fatiguing for lifters, especially if they are a bigger person who's getting into uh, training. So keep this sparingly. Um, don't use it too much. Make sure volume and intensity and frequency is all managed when using this technique. So if we have a more intermediate uh, advanced lift though, how can we start them with RPE? Um, I think the best way to do this is by using a camera. So set up a camera and film your sets. Uh, once you've filmed your set, uh, rack the bar, put it in, give yourself an RPE rating before you even look at the video. So you do your set of four or whatever, you say, oh, that felt like a seven. Okay, cool. Let's watch the video and see 
if that RP rating directly after finishing the set um, actually matches what it looks like. So <clears throat> we will just have a look. If the bar speed is super, super fast, we might know that we are either undershooting and have sort of, I guess, not a great idea of what a 7, 8, or 9 actually is without training. Um, or this person might just be someone that needs to be looking at their warm-ups, looking at bar speed, and making jumps based on how quickly their reps are moving on that day uh, rather than how good they feel. And this, this is like a very important distinction to make here with learning RPE is what you are actually good at and what you're going to get the most out of. Uh, again, this is just a thing where it comes down to practice. Getting good at RPE takes a lot of practice. It takes some people years and years and years to get good at doing it. And you will always make mistakes. You know, you think you might be feeling pretty good at this RPE five or six. And you might think you're good for a, a 10 kilo, 12 kilo jump or whatever. You take it, you end up a horribly overshooting to an RPE 8, 8.5. Um, and that's just a learning curve. It just happens. Um, so don't beat yourself up if you aren't the greatest at RPE at the beginning. Just practice. Work with your coach if you've got one. Um, they can be really valuable in this time too. So common mistakes. What I just talked about briefly there, what might happen that might cause us to sort of misuse RPE. So RPE can be difficult to use and the feel-based aspect can sometimes make lifters rely too much on emotion and can cloud their judgment on how a set actually feels. So some common mistakes I see with those new to RPE. Uh, one, thinking that an RPE 8 or 9 is a max out. So uh, this is seen all the time. I think this is mostly seen on bench press anecdotally with my athletes. Um, and then the opposite of that is true. The RP six or sevens are sandbag. They're not hard. They're super, super easy. And there is no middle ground for what's, uh, what's hard and what's just super easy. So those are a big ones and just misrepresenting what the RPs actually are. Um, next one is picking load for their sets without doing an exercise first or without actually going through their warm ups. Picking the load before touching the barbell is not a good idea with RPE. Don't get attached to your numbers. See what's there on the day. Uh, see what your body is capable of on that given training session. Uh, the last one, I think, is just people rushing and expecting to pick up RPE straight away and being really good at it. So this can go hand in hand with not understanding their personal RPE, so their connection with it and what they actually get the most out of. So lifters who move super slowly undershoot because the bar seeds slow down based on their camera angles, when in reality they are just a slow lifter and they can just keep going, keep standing up, those sorts of things. So getting used to what you use with RPE and what you actually look like as a lifter is huge here and that just takes time. You can't rush that. Benefits and drawbacks of RPE. So what's the pros? What's the cons? Because so far I've been hyping it up fairly, um, fairly highly. So let's take a look. So number one, benefit. Fatigue management, huge. Uh, this gives you the opportunity to uh, grow up when you're feeling good, go down when you're feeling bad, and manage your fatigue so that things sort of ride in this up and down scale to keep you moving forward as opposed to going up, 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 up. And then you get super, super tired and you start crashing all the way down again. So that's the biggest one, fatigue management. You get to look after yourself. You get to run longer training cycles before deloading, spend more time progressing rather than taking weed off training with those deloads. Number two, it gives you opportunity to use heavier weights or PR during training blocks. So specifically on singles, and I think this is awesome. So when you feel really strong, you can make the most of it, like we said with RPE. But if you use a percentage-based programs, a lot of them don't call for singles in a prep that are above 100%. You know, you don't get programmed too often one by one at 104% of your max. You know, it's usually a little bit closer to that. You know, it might be 95, 97 at the right end of prep where you're sort of seeing what you're capable of. And you might get to PR those last one or two weeks in the lead up. But if you're on fire, being able to use RPE lets you smoke those PRs much earlier um, and make even more progress and even more gains on uh, your training. So this also gives autonomy to the lifter, number three here, which I talked about briefly before. So they can feel in control of their own training. So uh, lets them, I guess, feel a little bit more in control, not like they're just being told what to do every single day. Really nice for lifters. Number four, this is the only negative that I think is to useful or I guess uh, actually applicable to RP. I don't think there's actually 
too much that is a drawback from it. And this is just being uh, athlete in experience or they just don't like using it. So it can be poorly used if the athlete is inexperienced or hasn't mastered their load selection, they haven't spent enough time doing it, or they just don't enjoy um, having the autonomy and the freedom to do this because some people lifters are like that. They just want to be told what to do. They want to go into the gym, look at their program and know, okay, I've got a set of five at 77% today. Like, cool. I just know exactly what that's going to be. I don't need to think. I just want to go in and lift. Um, that's why I have a coach as they tell me what to do. So some lifters are just like this. I wouldn't force them to use RPE if they don't want to. You can maybe start using it on some of the accessory stuff, things like that, um, as a way to start like you know, uh, drip feeding it in there and seeing if it is something that's plausible in the future. So I find that is the biggest drawback there is the inexperience, just being bad at RPE, so taking huge jumps, overshooting constantly, or just sandbagging really hard because they don't actually know what a 6 or 7 is. So we're moving to programming. What is the go with programming RPE? Is it just lazy? Um, I don't think so. So <clears throat> from a glance, uh, like I said, programming can seem lazier with uh, RPE because you just click six, seven, six, seven, six, seven, eight, 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 or whatever. Um, however, you sort of think about RPE, uh, but that this is just in sort of I guess relation to percentages because that number on the paper seems a little bit more uh, effortful. So. However, I think if a coach uh, truly actually knows how to use RPE and knows what their athletes are looking for and how to program for their athletes, uh, RPE can become hugely advantageous. So programming with RPE can take many forms and include many different things. Uh, oftentimes, programming with RPE can even include percentages, um, which is interesting. This might take its place as percentage-based drops for back offsets, uh, which is something I'm a huge fan of. Uh, for example, it might be a set of four reps on deadlifts at RPE 7. This might be followed by an additional two sets of four at a 10% drop from that previous weight that was just used. So this use of percentages within an RPE-based program allows for even better fatigue management and an effective way to accrue more volume without pummeling the lifter into the ground with hard, hard work all the time. We've also got things in our programming that we can take uh, and use and manipulate. So things like uh, RPE based ascending sets, descending sets, straight sets with RPEs, um, things like that. And they can all be super, super useful in many cases within a program. So if it, lifters feel rusty and like their technique isn't up to scratch, but eventually find their groove towards the back end of a session, uh, this is a great move to deploy. So using ascending sets is huge here. It gives them time to warm up with lighter weight. So by the time they feel good and find their groove, they can start pushing it on those higher sets. Uh, depending on how you use RPE for these ascending sets, you might technically just be giving the lifter more warm-ups than normal. So this is something to consider as well. Uh, this is giving them more time to dial in their technique, giving them more time to feel loosened up, ready to go, all that sort of stuff. You can also start thinking about the individual in front of you. If the lifter is a super heavy weight male who gets tired very, very easily, maybe ascending sets aren't for him as he might become tired before he even reaches his top set. Uh, the same could be true here. You might actually want to make them tired before they hit their top set. You might want them to be under fatigue so the weight isn't as heavy on that top set um, or just to get used to doing uh, hard lifting under fatigue like they would do in a comp by the time they get to deadlifts. There's so many different ways you can use these and variables you can manipulate. Uh, let's flip the switch and let's say we have a middleweight male or female who gets the the more they squat, uh, Hold on, let's think about that again. So you might have a middleweight male or female who gets better the more they squat. So their first set is garbage, the second set gets better, third gets better, fourth gets better, etc., etc. This is my this might be a situation where ascending sets are actually huge for them, uh, rather than the descending sets we might use for one of those big boys. I know this is typically true for things like bench press. Uh, the more time someone spends arching and getting into their bench setup, typically the better their arch gets, the better their bench press gets. So I'm a big fan of using ascending sets on bench as well. Uh, so the opposite is true for descending sets like I touched on briefly. Um, be sure that the lifter isn't doing too many hard sets. We can just use descending sets here as well. So if a super heavy is using this, uh, we want them to do that one heavy set. That's enough stimulus for them, but we still want to get the volume in. Drop the weight, drop the weight, drop the weight as we descend down that run, down that ladder. Uh, so straight sets, these are all common. This is, you know, your 3 by 10 at 7, 3 by 
10 at 8 or whatever on lap pull down or bicep curl or whatever you want to say. It is just straight set. Super easy. It's very common price amongst many, many programs, probably every program to be honest. Um, and it is mostly used for accessory stuff, but it does have value uh, in compounds and the comp lifts. So um, these are mostly thrown in without too much thought, but I think there's a lot to be said for straight sets and a lot of people miss out on using them properly. Um, so I'm going to use a practical example on this next slide to talk about straight sets and all that stuff. So let's take a look. This is a screen cap of a program that I have for one of my lifters. It's a primary deadlift day, secondary bench day, and a tertiary squat day. So we've got a heavy deadlift, a reasonably heavy uh, bench press, and some easy high bars. So what are we actually looking at here? This is going to be an example of a top set back off with percentage uh, drops for the deadlift. So we've got our single, our set of five at RP7. And then once we've done that set of five, we're taking the 10% drop from there. So we still get our volume in with the deadlifts without having too much work. Because if we hit this set of five at seven, the one that's on the screen here, this first top set, if we hit that two more times with interest set fatigue, those second and third sets would no longer be RP7. And if they were, it wasn't RP7 to begin with. So that's something to think about there is we're using this drop because we know if this person hit a seven, they're going to become tired. Their next set's going to be a seven and a half. The next set's going to be an eight. It could be higher than that. And we want to keep this load or this weight below an RPE seven. So we take a little drop down. Bench, this is the example I was talking about before, ascending sets. This particular athlete that this program's from um, is a lighter weight male. He gets a ton out of... Um, ascending sets, especially on bench. And this is particularly true after deadlifting. So he comes out of the deadlift really, really flexed and round. His arch isn't as good as it normally is. So we spend more time doing bench where the weight's lighter so he doesn't get too fatigued. We do our set of three at six, seven, eight, and then we have that drop again because I know if he hits another set of three, he's probably going to go above that eight margin. So a uh, huge one for bench, big fan of ascending sets there. Last one, the high bar squat. I've got this as a tempo and we have straight sets for this. So this person, like I said, he's a lighter weight male. He recovers very, very fast from volume. So his frequency is quite high. So this particular lifter squats four times a week. And this is one of the variations we're running. It's a high bar squat with a tempo and we're doing four sets of six at sub five. So very, very easy. We're just accruing volume here. And we're making it highly constrained. So it's a high bar. So it's instantly going to take kilos off the bar compared to his comp squat. And it's tempo. So again, slashing kilos off the bar. We're just using this to accrue volume. This lifter recovers insanely quickly. He needs the volume to get stronger. He needs the stimulus. But we can't keep pummeling into the ground by just giving him four sets of six or a top set of six with back offs or something like that. We need this day to be easy. We just need him to practice the skill of squatting. We need the volume to go through his legs so he's feeling good and strong for the next time he squats the same is true here with um straight sets for accessories just below this i think it moves into like a uh, uh i forget what it is maybe like a lap pull down three sets of 10 at rp8 or something like that just straight sets pretty standard stuff there um theoretically this high bar set could also be descending it could achieve the same thing we could have a top set at rp5 6 and then drop down to RP5, sub 5, um, and repeat the same thing. So we could have that approach here too, uh, but I think that is probably better suited to um, larger individuals who aren't, aren't going to have the same sort of uh, frequency as this lifter in particular. So uh, that's a real-time example of what a program might look like that incorporates uh, what we just talked about on the previous slide with ascending sets, descending sets, straight sets, or percentage-based drops from the top. Uh, that's all from me guys with RPE uh, if you have any questions about anything at all no matter how small it may be uh, please feel free to drop a comment below on the on the YouTube or reach out to me on Instagram david underscore perform motion send me an Instagram message there I'll be more than happy to help and answer any questions you have um, for coaching DM me on Instagram or file an application through the website uh, www.performmotion.net um, and jump on the website and do that Otherwise, subscribe to the channel. If you have any videos that you want to see, drop them in the comments um, and reach out. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Uh, cheers, guys.